This is a talk on the tips, tricks, and history of card game roguelike design. And uh, I'm the director of a community author card game called Spell Source. And I've created games and media for Mozilla and Disney, New York Times, this architecture firm called Perkins and Will. Uh, and I'm here in San Francisco. And I'm going to talk about a specific kind of roguelike, which is uh, using card games as the metaphor for the stuff that you do inside an RPG. Uh, the cards, they're your player character's spells, they're the weapons, the equipment, the minions you conjure, the encounters that you face, uh, and you're usually building a deck using these cards. It's abstracting away stuff like experience points and equipment and leveling up. So if you've ever played an RPG, if you've ever played Magic, you're going to be familiar with what this looks like. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. I'm going to talk about design and engineering so you get a whole scope of this genre. And to introduce the history, I really want to show you a tech tree. So there's actually a lot of different ingredients that go into what we think of as a modern card game roguelike that started a really long time ago. And we're not going to talk about all these things all at once. Uh, I just want to give you a big picture preview of how a bunch of different games contributed to the mechanics that you see and that sadly nothing is original. <laughs> so the first game I want to talk about is Magic the Gathering. Specifically, it's draft formats. People were already playing something that had a significant number of the ingredients that went into what we think of as a card game roguelike in the tournament system in Magic 1995. That's using a booster-based draft. It doesn't take a genius to see how drafting cards from booster decks could be used for so many different exciting things. But I think the most interesting part is the permadeath in the tournament format. Like, once you're out, you're out, right? You, you get to keep your deck. You get to get the thing you bought. But it's not like every other multiplayer game wants to get you back in playing over and over, and over again for those retention numbers. You're out. And, that is a form of permadeath that I think most people are a little afraid of, but it was there. And there's all this other stuff that you saw in this really, really smart game. There's also Spellfire, which came out at the same time that was a very similar strategy card game that nobody has really heard about, but is also very good and an important part of that time. Simultaneously, this isn't really a card game. It's not really an RPG. It's something all over and in between. Here's a Mike Magic figured out the UX for a lot of what we see in contemporary card game roguelikes. Do you see that battlefield that's playing on the video right now? Does that look familiar in a modern game? People have figured out how to put the, you know, the friendly characters on the left and the enemy characters on the right. That was done in JRPGs. That was done earlier than Heroes of Might and Magic, but I just want to show you that a big mainstream game had already been training people in a lot of the stuff you've been doing. It also had a little bit of nap, map navigation, which Magic doesn't have, and a lot of people were still figuring out how to do that. A big, straight-up RPG in card games is Munchkin, which, you know, I did a little poll to see, like, who likes Munchkin, and I get a lot of not the most positive feedback for what is generally a pretty good game. So I think uh, what they introduced, a lot of people did this in board games already. It's not that original, but in the context of a card game RPG, the random encounter order where you're drawing cards from a deck, this introduced that mechanic to a lot, a lot of people. They started getting familiar with what it was. You still drafted, you also thinned your hand. So this had a lot of interesting uh, uh, kind of equipment management in your hand, but otherwise it was it was so simple and straightforward and clear what you were supposed to do. This kind of set the stage for, okay, I can deliver an RPG and a card game and people will really enjoy it and tell their friends to play it. And there's a weird game I want to show you, Mega Man Battle Chip Challenge. This is a Nintendo DS game that probably not that many people played, but what you're seeing in the video right now is something called the quote battle chip system. Each of those little columns corresponds to like a little hand and you draw a card from that hand you can see all the different cards you know that's that's just what the metaphor is and you would play against another opponent that would have a similar like little battle chip arrangement and the idea was that your opponent will choose randomly from these few things on this turn that you're going to play against so you have a strategy you can put together based on the deck you build what you're going to play against. 
This was a really early example of a randomized encounter that I found. When we get to the more modern version of this sort of game, you're gonna see, wow, okay, where have I seen uh, characters who choose from a small set of random options to play against me in the metaphor of cards? And it was really surprising to find it here. I think this is one of the earliest like mainstream examples people are playing and enjoying the game. Dominion, actually, I don't think it's that influential for roguelikes. If you talk to uh, the folks who authored Slay the Spire, they, they talk about it, they really love the game. But like I said, there was deck thinning for a while. We've had drafting for a while. This isn't a fascinating strategy card game, but it didn't necessarily change anything about modern designs of card game roguelikes. And so I just want to put it out there. It's a fantastic game, but I couldn't really put together how its mechanics contributed to stuff. I want to show you something else that was going on around that time. This is Pokemon Defense 2011, also known as Auto Chess. I mean, there are a lot of really great uh, uh, game scholars and critics who, who go on the record saying Auto Chess is this big original thing. And Pokemon Defense, it's like the most popular Warcraft 3 scenario in existence. So if you lived in China and played that game, you would see Pokemon Defense. You would know where this is from. And I just want to show you, if you're familiar with the mechanics of this game, you're drafting cards and building a little battlefield, and there's like a little elimination. You're playing against other people. It's exactly like Dota Auto Chess. It introduces a lot of stuff again in a different way. This isn't card game battling, but it's essentially picking cards and auto battling on, on the field. I just want to show if you were paying attention in 2011, you'd know people would find this appealing. And that's a long time ago. Uh, Card Hunter, I think, started to really crystallize for people on digital platforms as compared to Munchkin. Like, you can do an RPG through a card game. And this does a lot of the essentially D&D 4th edition rules in a game. And they started to put grid combat out there where it was meaningful, like where you were placing the cards to, to have some kind of tactical significance. Also brought back dice, which hadn't been around for a while. Dungeons & Dragons has a lot of dice. People think of RPGs as having dice. Here they did a very elegant, like, dice to card. You assign a die to a card, kind of activate its ability sort of thing that you're going to see again in a later game. But Card Hunter was doing it. Card Hunter is, you know, it's a great game. Uh, the game that people think of as really doing roguelike as a card game, like very clearly uh, Dream Quest, this guy Peter Whalen who made this iPad game. And... I think what he brought back that was so important was permadeath, right? You, you go and you play your life out and you die and you start again. There's a lot of the procedural generation that's sort of important, but card games, they always had like the infinite um, activity uh, uh, generator thing going on. Permadeath is really something special. It was hard to bring back. And Peter Whaling, he now works at Blizzard. They developed a Hearthstone, you can see the image I cribbed here from another very interesting talk about card game roguelikes, but you can see um, you know, uh, uh, Gabe Newell kind of greedily touching uh, bags of money there uh, that Blizzard has been accumulating. Hearthstone, they didn't have a roguelike format. They didn't have an RPG format. They had adventures, but they didn't have a procedurally generated random encounter activity until 2017. The biggest contribution was just increasing the size of the audience and figuring out battle mechanics. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, by 2015, there were already polished versions of like what uh, Dream Quest was doing. We don't necessarily hear of them. I mean, Guild of Dungeoneering is a successful Steam game, but it was already doing like, oh, I'm building out the map and put, moving my character around in this really traditional roguey format with cards, including the like pick one of three sort of deal where you're, you're putting down your equipment or your character by making choices from three. This was something that Guild of Dungeoneering was doing. Uh, so again, anybody paying attention, they're going to see these ingredients come out. Slay the Spire, uh, this, what started out as a humble LibGDX game, and became this big phenomenon in introducing this genre to a lot, a lot of people. Uh, they did two things I think is really amazing. They really, really opened up uh, their game development to the community. The two years they spent in early access, which involved a lot of releasing content. You heard this from 
eight <laughs> from Thomas too from from how important it is to get feedback from your players in real time. They were doing this to a, a way that really honed down the UX of card game roguelike, got it back to a format we saw all the way from Heroes of Might and Magic, something that was this really fantastic UX and packaged it in such a nice and polished way. And uh, they also embraced mods. People can edit their Java game and put in new cards. And this was a way that the players could take agency and communicate back to them what they want to do without asking permission. Uh, they also did graph navigation. A lot of people talk about how you can choose your encounters on a, on a map that's just represented by a graph instead of moving around in a, like a 2D grid. Uh, Dicey Dungeons is another great and very recent card game roguelike, which again, it's like we've seen dice from uh, Card Hunter, you can take the one mechanic from Card Hunter and run with it and you're gonna get this fantastic game and all the like little details of like, oh, you're gonna see later, you're gonna move around on a, on a graphical map and you have your, your enemy on the right and you have your own stuff in the lower center, like all these details are just figured out and at this point we've, we've kind of honed in on the genre UX and people are familiar with what they're doing, you can do more interesting stuff. So. I guess the summary is it's been done. So if you're paying attention, you're gonna have something interesting you can take from and develop and bring into modern UX, right? That's kind of the shtick here. And to stick to the metaphors, right? Cards and decks are the metaphors for a lot of the stuff and shuffling is your randomization. So this brings us to design. Let's talk a little bit more concretely about it. And I'm gonna give you some opinions, okay? <laughs> on where you can innovate. You want to write one of these games or maybe inform something you've been developing. It's super hard to beat Hearthstone's battle format. Like Dicey Dungeons is fascinating because uh, it really does take on the like smashing three twos into two threes thing that Hearthstone does and it did a great job. That is, if you want to do that, you're going to spend your entire game development time just figuring out how to make a better battle format than Hearthstone. But personally, I think everything else is up for grabs. So let's talk about the battle format, just so you understand. This game, who's played Hearthstone? Who's played Magic? A lot of people played Magic and Hearthstone. So you'll see these contrasts. Uh, I love this game because you can just talk about the cards, you'll know what it's, what's going on. And the battle format really emphasizes like, everything you need to know, it's written on the card. Short text, small number arithmetic, few keywords. I don't know if you've seen Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, where there's two zeros in front of every number that's written there. But, you know, people like that. I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But don't do that. Don't add more zeros. <laughs> you don't need any more zeros. Just, just keep it like small integers, bytes, shorts. Uh, interactivity. We've heard this word said in questions, which was so delightful. Uh, in Hearthstone, you're building you and your opponent's puzzle boards, and you're solving each other's puzzle boards. You can do this in a PvE setting. It's very, very fun. This card, Defile from Hearthstone, it's this really arithmetic-heavy card where as soon as it was introduced to the game, people played the puzzle building totally differently. Like, they didn't want to put on the board numbers of health that went one, two, three, four. Something so weird and so idiosyncratic. Anyone who's played this game is like, yes, I know exactly what he's talking about, but more importantly, you can just look at the card and you can tell. There's something about the text where you can imagine how the interactivity, how your opponent has to play around this card or how you're going to, going to use it, it's really interesting. And finally, digitization. Like, what, how do you force mechanics to work in a, in a digital way? Uh, Counterspell is such an important part of magic. You're supposed to interrupt your opponent's turn playing Counterspell, right? In Hearthstone, you play on your turn something called a counter spell that will counter whatever is the next spell your opponent plays during their turn. So now you don't have to you don't have to uh, oppose their, you don't have to interrupt their turn anymore. But because there's other junk that's secret that you don't know, you could have played a potion of polymorph. Your opponent doesn't know what the secret card is, so they have to play around what it is that you played. It might be Counterspell, it might be Potion Polymorph, blah, blah, blah. The point is, Counterspell, yeah, it's interactive in Magic the Gathering. Like, they're, they're, what, there are like seven or eight Counterspells printed in that game, and there's just one in Hearthstone. And like, some Magic formats, you have to remember how many different Counterspells there are, 
and like, is your opponent going to have them? That's a little bit more arcane than just, well, I played a minion and it didn't trigger Potion of Polymorph, so must be Counterspell. Like, it's just simpler and it, I think it made it a more interesting game. Just embrace how your the handcuffs of digitization. But so let's talk about everything else. Like, you get it. Okay, Hearthstone's great. You don't need me to tell you that. <laughs> but there's all this other stuff, and I put little hatch dotted lines around things that are sort of new, nobody's really done yet, like persistent worlds in, in card game roguelikes. I mean, MUDs and, and a lot of the multi-user roguelikes have had persistence carrying around people's corpses and stuff for a really long time. You don't have that in card game roguelikes left. Navigating by quests, completely randomly authored cards. We're going to hear stuff about procedural generation of spell-like things later, but I want to talk about some of those things. Uh, navigation is something we look at Slay the Spire, we're like, okay, graph navigation's really great. Maybe there's something about the battle system. You actually see a screenshot, the second one from the left. That's what Slay the Spire looked like around 2017. Um, my hint to you is it should all fit on one screen. Whatever you're doing, fit it on one screen. There are people who've tried to make card games where the gameplay takes place on three screens instead of one, and it's really, really challenging for people I think it's a smart design choice, but try to just shove it in there. And I'm gonna, you're gonna have a hard time finding a like Apple Design Award-winning mobile card game or like a really breakout hit strategy game nowadays, unless you're making Civilization or Hearts of Iron. It's gonna be tough to not fit it all on one screen. Have people like it? Permadeath, which. Thomas, you touched on this a little bit when talking about ADOM. I'm going to give you a slightly different point of view. So you do testing, right, or you collect data on what people have been doing and playing inside your game, but people who lose, they just stop playing. Forget about them. So it's not going to show up in your data, all right? Your data is already massively biased. And something I learned from looking at the Hearthstone data, HS Replay, big popular like pro-level Hearthstone Replay data aggregator, that's the average player uh, uh, skill, okay? That's that little little normal curve. That's an HS replay user in the middle. That's all Hearthstone users. If you just sample people at random, which means people who haven't played Hearthstone yet, their skill is going to be even worse than a Hearthstone player, right? So the thing that your community will consist of, HS replay, could be two standard deviations better than a random person on the street. And my little trick to you is the start of every life should be winnable by playing randomly. Literally, if you hit random keys and you moved into random places and you did random stuff on the screen, if the player wins, you have succeeded. And there's a really good theoretical reason for that, which is for somebody who doesn't know anything at all, it's indis their behavior is indistinguishable from playing random. So if you want to bring back permadeath in your game, you can say, like, oh, is it easy or is it hard? Listen, it's really simple to evaluate. Just close your eyes and do random stuff. And if you're on level two, you succeeded. <laughs> In terms of modding, which I think Slate Aspire has a lot of going on, like, just do what, exactly what your players are asking for. This is a GitHub page for a game called Pokemon Showdown. Has anyone heard of Pokemon Showdown? It has, like, 15,000 concurrents, and uh, people play with... Uh, community authored Pokemon in a in a tournament format in a really traditional like I'm I have my team of five Pokemon versus six versus your team of six Pokemon okay and I tried playing it's like playing real life Wikipedia like you just have to memorize all these like little details about Pokemon and I'm like I don't know any of this stuff but some a lot of people find this really really fun and not just because it's a Pokemon property right it's it's got all this community involvement. And they had a lot of ways, 17,000 commits, right? A lot of ways that they're going for getting people engaged with contributing. So do that. It's that simple. If you want to do random cards, and again, uh, people have touched on this in other talks, it's a huge engineering challenge. This is something I've tried to do. It's really difficult to create stuff that looks and plays good. If you read like Slate Aspire talking about a lot of what they were testing was just showing people three cards, see which one they picked. And a more formal way of doing that is when you're making content, like strategy card game content, any strategy game content, in my opinion, it's got to look good and play good. 
Okay, no one's going to pick a card that looks bad, even if it plays bad. They're just not going to stay in your game long enough to get to the wiki, to look at the guide, and blah, blah, blah. So just, if it doesn't fit in that corner, just cut it. And it turns out that's very difficult to do with random content. But with a model that can maybe give that data feedback into the system, maybe, maybe it'll work. So there's a lot that you can work with. Like, there's still, there's still so much to do. But this is, this is kind of my guideline to you. If you want to try doing this, either do something new with Hearthstone Combat and only focus on that, or just use it, and then look at all these other things you can innovate in with these few and simple constraints. So just to touch on engineering, because there are a lot of engineers in the room, uh, this is my experience from working on a multiplayer community-authored card game. It's got to work for a lot of skill levels. It's got to work for a lot of different content. Uh, for your client, use Unity. I'm not going to talk about that too much. For a rules engine, a lot of people write their own like virtual machine. How many like little games have their own like little rule system and their own like little programming languages? Uh, just use what is given to you. Uh, stuff that you're looking for is your code stack. You can see a spell source code stack on the right. It should look like your game call stack. So if something receives damage, eventually I should see like a class or a function called receiving damage somewhere in the stack. This little difference, it's going to make your life a lot easier. And the technology you're looking for to let you run a kind of rules-based game like this, some languages it's called fibers, coroutines are async, this sort of thing, you just want to look and see that it checks the box. For game state, uh, everybody reinvents something called an arena allocator. This is a really n surprisingly niche thing, but if you've ever you written the word entity in your code base, you've already reinvented an arena allocator. Okay, that's, that's what this thing is, and there is a cross-platform, strongly typed, mutable arena allocator written by guy who works for Cloudflare now called Cap'n Proto, and he was a Protobuf's 2 author. This is just a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but honest to God, you'll look at this and you'll be like, oh my God, this, is, this solves so many problems. And you know, you're gonna make a complicated like rules engine, you're gonna wanna use this thing. Uh, for coding cards, a lot of people write their own language for coding cards. They write it in Python or in Java. They write it as Java classes in something like Slay the Spire. They write it directly as Lua code inside Hakes for something like Dicey Dungeons. Just use a data format because uh, ultimately, you can, you can read the slide, I'm not going to read it for you. Ultimately, when you get other people to write the cards, the first thing that their body's telling them is, I don't want to write code. And something that doesn't look like code, but is code, that's A-OK, -okay, because at least they'll get started writing. But if you just show them Python, they're going to be like, oh, man, like, do I really want to do this? So this, I think, it worked a lot for me, and it works a lot for other games that use structured data formats to contribute content. That's true about a lot of strategy games, true about a lot of modding. If you look at especially Paradox games, uh, a lot of their earlier modding was achieved by big structured data formats, and that's what made Europa so successful and Hearts of Iron. Civilization, same thing. They had Python to do more complicated stuff, but they used this big, complicated structured data format for a lot of other modding. It's super important for getting contributions out. So that's pretty much it for just achieving some things with engineering, but I'd love to take some questions and talk some more. So thank you so much. Questions? Uh, great talk. Um, you talked a little bit about um, random card generation, and, and I also talked a lot about Hearthstone, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, some of the random card generation efforts that players have made for custom cards in Hearthstone, and kind of like the hilarious results of those things. Um, have, have, do you have any thoughts about um, employing those kind of garbage results that they get from random card generation intentionally in a game structure? It was a big part of my research a few years ago uh, to 
essentially do procedurally generated Hearthstone cards. Uh, Spell Source, it has a game engine that's essentially Hearthstone at its core with, with only a few major changes. And what I learned from that experience is, beside it kind of creating garbage, like you might have this hypothesis that, well, there'll just be, Google will release BERT and now I will try this new language model and I will get something better. And, uh, or maybe there's a way that I can turn English language text into code that the game understands, a game engine understands. And these are things that I've experimented with and in my opinion, what's missing is a, a big data set. And so spell source, uh, in terms of its contributions, probably has the most coded cards um, after uh, in a structured data format that these systems can work with. People have tried with Xmage, the magic simulator, has like 14,000 coded cards, but that's in Java. It doesn't really work. So there's still a lot to work, uh, work around the representation of a strategy card game card, and that's really the obstacle. Someone's got to come up with something clever with that. If you follow the rules I have for card authoring, you're going to be a lot closer to something that works with those card generators than, say, just writing your cards in, in a programming language. This is uh, more of a statement or, or, a, or a comment than a, a question, and, and yeah. maybe you would have expected this, but I, I kind of had to bring it up, where at the end you've made a lot of very, very opinionated, uh, definitive, <laughs> uh, technical uh, dissection, <laughs> decisions, and uh, like, uh, why, why Unity versus Unreal, for example, why Captain Proto versus Flat Buffers or Protocol Buffers, uh, like, obviously, there are trade-offs to these things, uh, but depending on what your background is and who you are, like, uh, basically, my, my comment is that maybe you should add, like, two options or some alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Like, the market, it gives you a lot of options, and uh, I personally felt I'm less qualified to comment on a lot of different game engines. Uh, especially with my experience uh, with authoring card games, writing the en the rules engine was a much bigger, like eye-opening experience for me. And that's why I'm telling you about this kind of obscure serialization format and ways you can hack it into something useful. Uh, I think you're right. Like, don't worry so much about a, a tough choice for, for a client, but look at Cap and Proto, look at what fibers are, if you understand some of these technologies, it'll be something you can take back to every complicated rules game you're authoring, whether that's a roguelike or card game or whatever it is. What's an arena allocator? What is an arena allocator? In brief, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of how to like not make everybody fall asleep. So the gist is, you want to make a networked multiplayer game, which is really hard, right? And you're like, how do I get my data from point A to point B? And you're going to read a bajillion different ways to do this, and you're going to realize eventually you just need to take a, a byte buffer and send it from point A to point B. And you're like, but my game doesn't store its game state in byte buffers. It stores it in objects or in maps or in functors or whatever, you know? And it turns out that you would love to have something that in your code looks like variables and objects and classes and really conventional stuff, but which you can eventually send to Unity, for example, as a byte buffer. And then in Unity, it turns back into objects and classes. And an Arena Allocator is a trick when sometimes you want to add a new card to the game, or maybe you want to add a new effect, or maybe you want to uh, go from having one of something to two, stuff that's really conventional, and you want a representation of that that works with sending around byte buffers. And that's what an arena allocator does. It says, I can add data or increase state in a way where you're still able to go from one index to another, copy it and send it somewhere else, and then it is interpreted exactly the same. There's no actual serialization. This sort of detail, it's super important for the, the rules engine, because if you don't write that way ahead of time, 
you wind up with a problem where I had, where you're looking at some of these six-year-old code base, and you're like, how am I gonna make a, how am I gonna make a multiplayer experience out of this? Or how am I gonna make an AI that runs fast, because AIs need to copy this stuff really quickly. They need point A to point B buffering, but you know, your objects and functors game, it just doesn't do that. And you, you wind up spending months rewriting something in order to implement like a, an AI that is straight out of a textbook, right? So uh, this is something that it's just, I'm giving a word for something actually a lot, a lot, a lot of people already use. Uh, Arena Allocator, if you punch that into Google, it does exist, this is a real thing. But um, that's the word that you're looking for to describe something usually you're already doing. Uh, Patrick, do you wanna start setting up your laptop and I'll ask Ben one final question? Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about digital card games, um, but you didn't necessarily talk about um, what makes digital card games different from real ones. And I'm curious, you know, how you view the sort of things you can do. So like Magic, right? It's a paper card game. You can do various things with it, but like in the Magic Microprose game, they invented a bunch of cards that like choose random creatures from your opponent's deck that you wouldn't have knowledge over. And Hearthstone does this a lot with like a lot of random effects. And then, but then also there are now paper card games made digitally like Keyforge, which gets to invent random uh, synergies inside of the card game. How do you view that distinction? Yeah, so, uh, no, he brings up something really interesting. Magic, again, even it, with its Microprose pro partnered game, did a lot of this stuff that was looked like a roguelike. Um, the mechanics, uh, he's describing something in Hearthstone that's called a discover action, which they absolutely looked at the Microprose Magic the Gathering game from, from almost 20 years ago to come up with something like that. These things, they they are the shuffling and dice rolling and random elements that really the computer referee does a lot better. You could tediously do with cards. Uh, I think where we've seen it the most is in something like Dicey Dungeons where really rolling that many dice and moving them around all the time would be, su would be super big drag and so would doing a lot of shuffling. But uh, if you wanted to prototype something like that in the card game, don't be shy. Like in the phys you can, you can cheat. You can do all these effects physically before you start programming them. And I, I think Noah's right that that stuff, it's very important for making something felt very new. Cool, thank you so much.